If you've been listening to us talk about games for a while now, you know that developers love adding little details to their games, things that just really heighten the experience. Today we're talking about little tiny details that were added to add gameplay. Random moments in games where you do something completely different or something just feels totally different, just clever things that we thought were worth mentioning. We got 10 cool examples, so let's get started off with number 10. Now the campaign mode that has five separate segments and is in total only about five or six hours long, it shouldn't be surprising that Battlefield 5 is going to introduce some ideas and concepts that don't get much screen time. It's following the Call of Duty model of giving you quick little alternate gameplay styles that last only a few minutes or at worst only a few seconds. A lot of this stuff just kind of adds to the pacing and a lot of it isn't totally noteworthy but we think the skiing is here. In one of the game's chapters uh, you play play as a Norwegian freedom fighter on a mission to rescue her mother from a German-held facility. And after a quick setup, you switch to the main character of the episode with your objective way out in the distance. How do you get there? Well, by skiing. Uh, it, it's a surprisingly impressive simulation that only really lasts a few minutes or less, but it's there. Honestly, I would have liked to do a little more skiing in the game, but you know how these military first-person shooter campaigns work. You can finish this stuff in an evening, so there's no time to just take in the sights. There's killing and first-person shooting to be done. But still, it was a clever little addition in a campaign that really didn't get too much traction. Now next over at number 9, uh, the Call of Duty franchise. It's jam-packed with these alternate gameplay styles. Sometimes they're well integrated into the games and sometimes they're really not. Now you can't deny the Black Ops sub-series for its ambition, but those games are the absolute worst about integrating their alternative ideas into gameplay. They're constantly introducing new concepts or switching up the gameplay for only a few minutes at a time and then never really revisiting them again. Now in our mind, the perfect example of this sort of thing is in the mission WMD in the awesome first Black Ops game. There's this whole elaborate setup where your player character climbs into a Blackbird and flies into low Earth orbit, then switches over to a thermal screen where you can give order to a CIA infiltration scene. It seems like this is going to be the gimmick of the level, like kind of like the Death Room Above mission in the first Modern Warfare, but it's bizarrely short. After giving an order, then you just switch back to controlling the CIA team now. It just leaves me wondering, why did they go through all of the trouble of showing this airplane take off and introduce this new gameplay mechanic where you barely even get a chance to use it? I got him. Kilo 1, this is Big Eye 6. I have you on the TRP. Roger that, Big Eye 6. We have zero visibility on the ground. We need you to guide us to the comms relay. Maybe there was originally going to be more of it and the developers of Treyarch just thought it was boring or it didn't help the pacing or they had to cut it for budgetary reasons. I don't know, but it's a strangely in-depth setup for what ends up just being another run and gun Call of Duty mission. Next over at number 8, let's talk the Final Fantasy VII Remake and the dance-off. I mean, some people are going to ask, where did this come from? It's not just out of nowhere, it's also really elaborate. For some reason, in the middle of the Final Fantasy VII Remake, we get this elaborate dance number slash rhythm game where Cloud has to prove something. I don't know, his intentions? To get the dressmaker to make Cloud a dress... Listen, uh, reason has very little to do with this whole thing. This is just the game developers having some fun here with a self-indulgent sequence that just goes way harder than it has to. <laughs> The thing is, it only lasts a few minutes, and in terms of gameplay, that part is even shorter, and once it's done, that's it. There will be no more dancing in Final Fantasy VII. They got it out of their system, and it's done. We actually wish there was a little more. There are a few other mini games to try out in the wall market area, of course, but this one just comes so out of left field, lasts for no time at all, and then is never mentioned again. You gotta respect the ambition and the fun, if nothing else, man. Next over at number 7, let's talk Guardians of the Galaxy. Now, you'd think dogfighting would be one of the central pillars of a game like this, and before release a lot of people asked about it, so maybe this section is just the developers uh, more short-term jamming in some space combat right before the deadline. I don't know how that stuff works, I don't want to speculate, but here's the thing. There's only one moment where you actually get in a space battle in the entire game, 
and it's really short. It's not a few seconds at least, it's longer than that, but it doesn't feel much longer. In chapter 9, the crew gets ambushed by this guy called Captain Glory, and the only way to escape is to take him out and his little fleet. In this section, you finally get full 360 degree control of your spaceship, and enjoy it while it lasts though, because it's going to be the last time. I would love to hunt you down. And feed your ego? No thank you. There are a few moments before and after this part that let you control the ship, but they're more like playable QTEs where you're stuck going in one direction. This little segment actually lets you cut loose with guns and missiles, and while it's pretty basic as far as combat depth is concerned, it's still a fun little sequence. It's not up to the level of like the Halo Reach space combat segment, but it's pretty good for how short it is. Next over at number six, let's talk a way out. Uh, this co-op action adventure game is filled with little distractions, but the one that really stands out the most to us in terms of the effort put into it is the Connect 4 game. So it's found in the hospital lobby at the start of the chapter, A New Life. Uh, th this game is exactly what you'd expect. It's, it's Connect 4 and you take turns dropping in chips or the tokens or like whatever those little round things are called and whoever makes a row of four vertically, horizontally or diagonally wins. The thing that stands out to us is just how good this looks. Most games would just switch to some kind of boring interface or make it so the pieces fall on their own, but this game goes all in, showing the characters fully modeled, carefully animated to pick up each piece and manually drop them into spaces with dialogue lines. It's one of the best visual representations of a board game out there in video games. Like, I'm not that sure I'd be all that impressed if I sat down and watched two guys play Connect 4 in a movie for a minute. And so it's completely pointless in the game. It's, it's not something you're forced to do. And in fact, both players need to sit down to do it. So it has to be mutual. The way out is just filled to the brim with these kinds of nice but unimportant details. Just stuff that has a little depth, a little bit of character building, maybe even a little building between the two people playing it cooperatively. I, I don't know. And this is just a really cool example of that. Now, next over at number five, Resident Evil 6. That was a weird game, huh? <laughs> it was definitely ambitious, but in ways that people didn't exactly want for a Resident Evil game. I mean, this game cranked up the action movie insanity all the way up. And that's why we get a segment where you pilot a jet fighter in a Resident Evil game. I, I can't even begin to explain why any of this is happening, but there's literally a part where Chris Redfield and his buddy um, Pierce, like they, they jump into a jet and attack an aircraft carrier. Do I need to explain why this doesn't feel like Resident Evil? Gotcha! Either way, you know, I mean, this game is actually full of these little gameplay changes. There are multiple car chases, for example, but the jet fighter just stands out in our mind as the most bizarre and unnecessary. It's not bad for what it is, but why is it in a Resident Evil game? Why is it so elaborate? Capcom, I guess, maybe wanted some of that Call of Duty money at the time, and that means throwing in a few weirdly elaborate gameplay changes that never come up again, because that's what people really like about other games, right? I think over time, people have softened on Resident Evil 6, but there's still some weird stuff. We, we had to mention this. Thank you, Alpha. We have an emergency. The missile is preparing to launch. How in the hell? Next over at number four, uh, to say that No More Heroes 3 takes some pretty strange turns would be an understatement. I mean, it's a game with wild shifts in tone, presentation, and even gameplay. Sometimes it works, sometimes it really doesn't, but it's definitely unique. You gotta admit that, there's a reason why people like these. There's a few oddball bosses that show up uh, before the rank three battle with Sonic Juice, but this one really is something else because instead of being your standard hack and slash combat, this time you're forced into an old school RPG battle for whatever reason. Preemptive strike, legendary water. We got to attack with command input? We take turns attacking. It's an extremely fair way to do battle. Uh, this is f hardly the first game to pull out the RPG fight gimmick, but it's one of the most recent that we can think of and somehow manages to be one of the strangest. I mean, just look at this guy. I, for, uh, he's got hands for nipples. Gotta love the developers. <laughs> 
Sonic Juice has taken heavy damage! Sonic Juice Special Attack! Legendary Water! I mean, a special mention has to go to the entire fake beat em up that pops up twice in the game called Deathman. You could spend just a few seconds in here if you want, but there's an entire game that can be played through. Bizarre and kind of bad, but it's there. It's just a little too long to be on this list by itself, but it's such a jarring gameplay shift that it stands out. The grungy ass Sega Genesis soundtrack and visuals also give Deathman a unique edge that makes it so memorable. It's not exactly good, but it's hard to forget. Now, next over at number three, you know, for a game series about the criminal underworld, there's actually very little gunplay in the Yakuza series. Sure, there's things once in a while, and sometimes story-wise, some bad guys will whip out a gun during a big dramatic moment, but actual gunfights are almost non-existent in the world of Yakuza. Well, I mean, except for in this frankly insane sequence near the end of Yakuza Zero, where Kiru blows away dozens of guys during a car chase. Almost all problems are resolved in Yakuza with a manly fist fight, but there's no time for that here. Just blow away everything in sight. It starts off crazy with the amount of guys and cars chasing you and then escalates to a helicopter and a rocket launcher and it doesn't let up. Keep in mind, this is like the only sequence in the game like this, and even though it only lasts for a few minutes tops, it's so over the top that we can't help but think about it. This series has always had an interesting take and how it handles killing and stuff, and uh, this, is, this is a really good example. I don't know, I don't know how this stuff lands. Oh, Next over at number two, uh, let's talk Bayonetta 2 and the Loki chapter. Uh, what on earth is going on here? For some reason, in chapter five and chapter five only, there's an incredibly short sequence where you switch characters from Bayonetta to Loki, this little kid with magic tarot cards. Yeah, the character is introduced before this moment, but what makes the switch so jarring is that one, he's got a completely different play style to Bayonetta, focusing on using cards for long range attacks, and two, that's it, you never play as him again. And this isn't like a Devil May Cry 4, Bayonetta 3 situation where protagonist duties are swapped between two characters. No, you just switch to him in this one random instance and then never play as him again. I mean, it's not like I really wanted to ever play as this kid. I'm more of a Bayonetta fan. I'm really here for the main event, but it's strange that he's even playable at all, especially because the segment with him is so incredibly short. It's possible to finish it in under a minute if you rush. Uh, Loki doesn't have the mechanical depth of the main character, obviously, but it's still a new playstyle that you barely get to learn before he goes back to being an NPC that you never see again. The only thing I can really think of is that Loki was originally going to play a larger role but then Platinum came to their senses and realized that nobody really wants to play as this kid, so get him out of here. But they didn't want to waste all that hard work they spent building him, uh, so there's a minute of gameplay here. That's just pure speculation, of course. We're just armchairing it here. Platinum actually does this sort of thing sometimes, but Loki's section stands out as being particularly short and weirdly pointless. Now down at number one, let's talk Metal Gear Solid 3 and The Nightmare. I mean, Metal Gear games switch up the gameplay on occasion, but it's mostly for big climactic moments where those changes feel appropriate. But whatever this is just feels really random as hell. So in it, uh, after Snake gets captured, if you save the game and then load while still in the jail cell, you'll load into something totally unexpected, an entirely different game. Instead of the usual melodramatic sneaking action story players have come to expect from this series, they're treated to a bizarre hack and slash where a guy with two hook swords fights zombie policemen in an empty warehouse. The gameplay, the visuals, and the entire theme of the game don't mesh with Metal Gear Solid 3 at all. It's not even period appropriate. All this stuff looks vaguely futuristic. You're supposed to be like during the Cold War here. All you do is run around killing enemies until the dream ends and Snake wakes up. I have to emphasize just how random this feels. It has absolutely nothing 
to do with the rest of the game. In fact, it doesn't even feel like the rest of the game. It just feels like it was made by a totally different developer. That's not actually the case, though. Apparently, at least according to the Metal Gear fan wiki, the game was derived from the prototype build of Zone of the Enders 3. So uh, it appears that all of this stuff was built intentionally for this game because Zone of the Enders is its own can of worms, but there's not zombie cops in it. Unless the third game was going to be really different from the other two. Who knows with Hideo Kojima and his team. Whatever, you can end this bizarre dream in seconds, but the whole thing is so out there and bizarre that it's hard to forget. It's not even that scary. It's not like an actual nightmare sequence. It's just random, but it's so unexpected that it does feel kind of creepy. And you know what? It's just another one of the many reasons why we love Metal Gear Solid. But those are 10 examples of random times where developers added just a few minutes of completely different gameplay to change up things. Whether it be for good or bad, they're clever examples, definitely. Let's talk about all this stuff down in the comments. If you got any other examples for us, we'd love to hear it because there are definitely more out there, I, I know for sure. But if you like this video and you like talking games with us, we do it every day. So all you gotta do is click the like button. It helps us. Thank you, for real. But as always, thank you for watching and we'll see you guys next time.